Good morning to those joining us in the UK and good afternoon to all of those joining from South Asia. My name is Hitan Mehta and I have the privilege of being the Executive Director at the British Asian Trust. The British Asian Trust is an organisation that is driven by the British Asian Diaspora and His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, who we are so fortunate to have as our Royal Founding Patron. We are supported by some of the most incredible people across South Asia and here in the UK, which enables us to make the most positive difference possible for poor and marginalised people across South Asia. To date, we have had a positive impact in over, on the lives of over 5 million people. At times like this, when there is a global pandemic affecting the lives of hundreds of millions of people, our organisation is more important than ever. On Monday this week, we launched our Oxygen for India emergency appeal following the alarming rise in cases of COVID-19 across India. So far, we have raised over £1.5 million with over 10,000 individual donations so far, with more support coming from corporates such as British Telecom, Morgan Stanley, BlackRock and others. We also have significant donation from the Indian Premier League team, the Rajasthan Royals. Together with so many other partnerships that are being formed with li the likes of Sunrise Radio, NDTV 24-7 Here and Now, the British India Jewish, Jewish Association, the Bharat Army, various schools in the UK fundraising to support the cause, and of course support from His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, our Royal Founding Patron. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, the British Asian Trust has been running a series of webinars as part of our BAT Insight series. And I'm humbled to see so many of you join this particular important and urgent session today, focused on the situation in India today, and to learn more about how the British Asian Trust is utilizing the funds raised through partners on the ground. Today, we're joined by His Excellency Alexander Ellis, the British High Commissioner to India, Najiket Moore, board member of SWAST, our partner in India on this emergency appeal, Dr. Ajay Nair, the Chief Executive Officer at SWAST, and Salim Khan, the Director of the British Asian Trust in India. And we're also joined by our host, one of our long-standing supporters, and now trustee, Fazana Bajwell. Fazana is the founder and CEO of Curzon PR. I wish to thank our hosts and panelists for joining us today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before I hand over to Fazana to facilitate the session, please let me point out a couple of things. If you wish to ask a question, feel free to type them in the Q&A box and we'll pass them on to Fazana and time permitting, we'll get to them. The event is being recorded. I hope that's all clear. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Fazana. Hello and welcome to the BAT Insight Series. Thank you so much for, um, for dialing in and, um, and seeking to understand what is the situation in India and what are we doing and the BAT community are doing to support. So first of all, I'd like to share a bit more information about our panelists. Uh, we have His Excellency Alexander Ellis. Um, as um, my colleague Hitton mentioned, he's the British High Commissioner to India. Uh, he previously worked as the Deputy National Security Advisor for the Integrated Review on Foreign um, and Security Policy. He's also Director General previously in the Department for Exiting the EU for three years. And Alex also had a previous life as a teacher, including in India. Welcome, Alexander, and thank you for joining. I would also like to introduce uh, another panelist that we have, Nachiket Moore. Uh, he has a PhD, he is a board member of SWATS. He has deep experience in the development sector and specifically in the health sector in India. SWATS is our partner in India on the appeal and, um, and he was previously the India country director for the, Bell, for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation from 2015 to 2019. Welcome Nachiket. May I also introduce and share some more information on Dr. Ajay Nair. So Ajay is the CEO of SWATS. It's a globally unique coalition of health sector organizations operating in India and coming together to contribute time and resources to build a better health system for, uh, for the country. In 2010, he launched Mira Doctor to become one of India's largest telemedicine network 
serving over 700,000 patients across every state in the country. Welcome, Ajay. And we have Salim, Salim Khan. He joined the British Asian Trust in January 2019. He is the country director for the British Asian Trust. Um, and he has more than two decades of experience across the private sector and the not-for-profit sector in India. He's responsible for building and executing our vision and growth plans in India. Salim has a long background in financial services. Welcome, Salim. Now we're going to focus this session on two main areas. So one part is going to be really to understand live and direct from India, what is happening and what is the, the situation on the ground. And then the second session we're going to move to would be about you know, what are the myriad of ways that we can support um, those in need. And so first of all, I would, um, I'd like to ask a question to Salim. Uh, Salim, we've read so many heartbreaking stories in the media. This, you know, the whole international community um, are aware of the situation and it's heartbreaking. Um, the impossible situations that people are facing and it's really brought home to us at BAT by the tragic situation that, that you had to face on Saturday. Um, I'd be grateful if you can share with us yeah, oh. thank, thank you. Thank you, Farzana. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to step aside from my shoes of uh, the India Director of British Asian Trust and answer this question as uh, a common man, a citizen of India, uh, and share my personal experience. Um, this was something, I'm, I'm sorry if I get a little overwhelmed. I lost my dad on Saturday to uh, a battle for oxygen that, um, I'm sorry, a battle of oxygen that uh, he required. And, and just, just I'll just take two minutes to tell you about my personal story. My dad was not COVID positive. He had a lung condition. He, he, had, he was a chronic asthmatic. My wife is a doctor. Uh, we were managing at home. Everything was going absolutely, absolutely fine with him. Uh, he was regularly monitored. There was nebulization, et cetera, that he used to be getting regularly. And things were all fine. We almost kept him like a child incubated at home, protected from the COVID environment. In the last one month, he went for three COVID tests because we always dreaded that he should not catch the disease else he could succumb to it. But on Saturday morning, suddenly had uh, a, a, a huge bout of breathlessness, something that he had, we had not seen him having ever before. The nebulizations were not helping him. And, but his oxygen saturation continued to remain at a safe level of 95%. But my wife sensed that something was really wrong. And then she said, we, and, and something that we never thought that we should have done, we should have had stored some oxygen cylinders and kept at home because we should have imagined we might need it at some point in time. We had not done that. But then we thought my wife has connections with suppliers directly. She runs a clinic in the heart of Mumbai at Lokanwala. And, and, and we thought, you know, it should not really be a problem. But then she said, we need, we need to get oxygen and just try and arrange for that. I called three known suppliers to my wife who regularly supply medicines and other equipments to her. Uh, two of the phones were not answered. One was answered. He said, there's absolutely no cylinder available at all. I offered to pay a higher price, but to win. But he said, he gave me a suggestion saying, why don't you, if it's about just settling your diet, why don't you go and just check for the portable oxygen equipment that you get, which gives you know, oxygen availability for about 20 minutes. I, I drove to uh, uh, the close by you know, chemist. I was guided to the Kokila Bay in Dhirubhai Ambani. It's the biggest hospital in Bombay. I went there. There was absolutely no oxygen that was available. But he looked in the system and he told me three kilometers from there, there was a chemist which showed that they had one which was available. You know, I was driving in my car. I, I drove there. And just when I reached there, my wife said, his saturation levels are falling. I think you should come back because we'll have to see what we have to do. And then when I, when I, by the time I came back, my dad has already rested and uh, we couldn't do much. My reason of coming here and telling you this is, you know, this is something that a person living in urban Mumbai you know, enjoying all the privileges, having all facilities, having access to, you know, uh, all possible facilities was in a situation that, you know, which, which could not be helped at all. You know, that feeling of helplessness. Can you? 
definitely it's something that was not there for my dad i'm sorry uh, and i can't even imagine what the rural communities and people in the country locations may be going through when their families go through something like this which don't have access to any reach of any type and and don't can and, and cannot you know cannot have access to basic air that we take for granted i also just want to take two minutes to tell you the plight of the situation of hospitals you know there are people lying on pavements people waiting in ambulance for the next person to die in the hospital so that their person can be taken in and they can get a hospital a bed access to a bed or an oxygen cylinder i'm really sorry for being overwhelmed but i had it was my moral responsibility to come here and convey what the situation is in india i'm really grateful for all of you who are extending support to this drive it is my personal commitment that in india we will make sure that every 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 pound every rupee that you donate is going to be you know going towards that cause and we couldn't have partnered with someone better then swast on the ground so i'm really grateful and farzana uh, over to you uh, you know thank you for the opportunity of allowing me to share my story thank you selim so much for sharing your story it, you know i can speak on behalf of everyone that we are incredibly grateful for uh, for how brave you are to tell your story and how noble that in spite of the loss your focus is on on helping more people um ajay i'd, I'd like to ask you uh because you're on the front lines uh you know you've obviously been seeing what's the the havoc that covid has wreaked over the last 12 months uh, in india and you know it will be useful for us to understand from your insight why things have escalated so badly what is the difference between today and what was happening a year ago what are the key challenges that are facing people patients caregivers healthcare workers um if you could share that ajay would be grateful thank you thank you farzana um and and salim thank you for sharing uh what you went through over the last couple of days uh very deeply grateful for you to sharing that uh so i you know i'm not on the front lines in the sense that i think the people who are on the front lines are the are the active duty uh, doctors and paramedics and nurses uh, and and they're the ones who are putting their life in harm's way every day uh, i went to medical school in india uh, we have lost colleagues we continue to lose colleagues uh, you know on a weekly basis uh, i think what's different this time is that a we are seeing a lot more younger people uh, fall sick uh, we lost a call you know lost a psychiatrist yesterday who was on covid duty uh because everybody has been called in and she was 25 uh we there's and there's story after story after story uh so i don't for a second want to claim that i'm on the front lines i'm sitting at home at a keyboard reasonably safe uh driving this effort uh i think what's different this time is that you know a we see i mean obviously we're seeing a lot more uh a lot more people fall sick we're seeing a lot of people uh essentially need hospital care uh, definitely a lot more people need oxygen uh, at the same time and this is this is orders of magnitude different from what we saw last year uh, 10 to 15x um what we are also seeing is that there has been sort of a logistical uh, breakdown when it comes to things like oxygen uh and you know it, it's sort of hard to say how one could have predicted this i was talking to hospitals in delhi and elsewhere uh who were telling me that uh you know the liquid oxygen pipes are cracking because nothing was built for this kind of demand uh and this is leave you know leave aside the the absolute shortage that we had and the shortage was also the fact that you know initially there was uh there was a shortage of you know cryogenic containers to transport this oxygen uh and i think that you know in the cities you would start having this being solved over over the next few weeks but i think rural india uh which is it's going to be a logistical nightmare to actually get these tankers there or get these plants there and which is why we think concentrators are important and why we are focused on that in terms of you know how we why we think things have escalated so badly uh it's we don't really have great data neither on cases nor on deaths uh and you know it's the reality of of vital events reporting in in countries like india uh so i think a truer picture will emerge uh, over the next few months to years 
but I think that, you know, of course there was complacency. We had a very strict lockdown uh, last year. People came out of that and there was a gradual reopening. Uh, there were elections in multiple states. There were festivals. Uh, and, and, you know, so there was all of that happening. Uh, this is also an RNA virus that mutates. So I, I know that we had the British variant circulating here. We had the Indian variant. Um, unfortunately, also, we don't have enough sequencing. So, you know, we don't have a great picture of which variants exactly are circulating. Uh, so, you know, just triangulating from what we know, it's, it's you know, the complacency that set in, the mutations that happened, uh, the opening up that happened uh, late last year. Uh, I think, you know, all of that uh, together is, is essentially where we are uh, and where we've ended up. Um, was there another question, Fazan? I'm sorry, blanking on. Well, I think you answered it perfectly. Thank you, Ajay. Um, I wanted to actually just um, follow on from there and ask Mr. Moore, uh, you obviously have multiple years of experience in the healthcare sector, you're on the board of SWAP, um, and you obviously led the, um, as a country director for the, the Gates Foundation. Um, it would be really insightful if you could share with us an overview of the various efforts in India, and what do you believe um, you know, the experts are saying in terms of what are the key focal points that people should be focusing on in terms of supporting Thank you very much for having me on here. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm very grateful to the British people for the support that they've extended us. And, and uh, Mr. Khan, thank you very much for sharing your moving story. Uh, in Swast, uh, we run a helpline, uh, chat line to assist people. And I must say, it's heartbreaking how many stories we are seeing of, of this type. Uh, we do our very best to help people get the oxygen, get the bed. But as Ajay pointed out, uh, there are some constraints the system is uh, running into. Um, the, 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 the response, uh, frankly, has been uh, maybe it took a little bit longer than we had expected because the rise in cases uh, was far sharper uh, than you know, we had anticipated. So, so I, I will tell you that there was a delay, but uh, movement is taking place on multiple fronts now. Uh, clearly, the long-term answer, as the British people know, is getting the vaccination out. Uh, you really need, because that's what, if you saw the British-owned curve, which started to rise, not quite as steeply as ours, but started to rise, Israel went through the same process. It's the vaccine that I think made the rapid difference. And, and, and uh, uh, fortunately, we do have the vaccines. We do have production capability. Uh, there are temporary you know, backlogs uh, and things that need to be sorted out. But I would say the prognosis over the next three months, uh, a lot of it will rest on how quickly we can get the vaccine out. But of course, three months is several lives away, several situations away. So we have a two prong strategy that as a country, uh, you know, we are taking. One is at the, what I would call the front end, which is really where the patients are, where the oxygen is needed and such like. Um, you know, the oxygen availability, uh, the courts have gotten involved, the governments have gotten involved. India does not fortunately have a shortage, an aggregate shortage of oxygen. We are a very large steel producer and steel needs a lot of oxygen. Uh, so, uh, you know, as Ajay pointed out, tankers are needed, transportation is needed. There's a real shortage of cylinders to move um, uh, the, 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 the oxygen. I think a lot of this is being responded to and being dealt with. You know, if you ask the patient, they're not seeing it yet. You watch the television set, you're not seeing it yet fully play out, but I think it is starting to, to, to happen. The issue is that if we only work at the front end uh, and don't work to plug the hole in the boat, which is people coming in uh, to hospitals. Uh, as Swast, we had a meeting uh, of the CEOs of some of the largest hospitals and ask them, what can we do to help you, right? Surprisingly, the request was not give us more oxygen, you know, for our hospitals. The request was keep patients out by giving them more oxygen where they are at home, closer to home, start treatment early. Uh, don't let them wait for three, four days by the time the result comes out. Um, and as Ajay pointed out, this time, even the rural areas have not been immune uh, to, to, to this. You know, for example, one of the largest consignments that 
of oxygen concentrators that we have sent has been to a remote area. Many of you, you in the audience would not even have heard of the place in Bastar in Chhattisgarh. It's a deep tribal forested area. They tell us that the disease burden is rising faster than they can cope with it. It has weak infrastructure. What they need and what we are getting with your help uh, and that of so many people around the world is early intervention through oxygen at a low flow level. It doesn't look like an impressive device. It's a humble little machine, looks a bit like the Star Wars R2D2, but it is what is making the difference uh, between people showing up at hospitals too sick to be uh, rescued. Uh, even if full oxygen we made available at the hospital, mortality on ventilators, mortality at that late stage is very high. But if we respond early, right, uh, 90, 95% of patients can be prevented from going. And the other beauty of this intervention is it strengthens the health system. These oxygen concentrators are use, useful for asthma, they're useful for heart conditions, they're useful for delivering babies, so you're not building something that once the COVID is gone, you have to discard. In fact, you leave behind a much stronger capacity. So, so that is the twin prong response. My sense is the volume of concentrators we are getting, the government itself has been now proactively responding to this issue. You know, dates are hard to give, dates are hard to commit to, but I'm actually, uh, you know, despite all the gloom we are seeing here, you know, I'm seeing a ray of light uh, emerge out of this. And, you know, I think we have still got some weeks ahead of us that are going to be challenging, very challenging. Uh, but the enormous, you know, response of the world and the sheer spirit of uh, humanity coming together, right, left, you know, multiple religions, it has not mattered. I think it is going to see us through. I think three months is where we are going to see some of our most difficult situations, but gradually starting to improve is my belief and I must say my hope. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just a quick question, uh, maybe for Mr. Moore or, or Ajay. For those of us who know people in India, and and you know, and we obviously see a lot on on Twitter, what advice would we give to people that we know who are in need of oxygen? Where do they go to? Who do they contact? What are the organisations? What's the protocol to follow? So I, I will say something, and maybe Ajay can then add on to it. Um, there are many people stepping up to find the problem is that there isn't really a single process. You know, as Mr. Khan pointed out, by the time you Somebody tells you there's oxygen here, you go there, it, 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 it runs out, right? So broad advice, and you know, there's a new protocol that the many states are rolling out, is that don't wait to fall really sick. If you start to experience early signs of, uh, of uh, COVID, there is a protocol that involves virucinide that you can start relatively early, not too early, you know, as the doctor and Ajay will point out, if your oxygen levels fall below 92, 93%, the humble oxygenator comes out, the dexamethasone comes in, and really you should be showing up at hospitals at 85 or below in terms of oxygen. Most cases, there is where you will find uh, rescue and relief. There are many helplines. We in Swast run one as well. So anybody that wants to can jump in and put in a query. We assign a volunteer to them. There are terrific volunteers that are working 24 hours a day, keeping track of what's going on where. Um, but I would say that would be the strategy to follow. I don't know, Ajay, if you want to add something to that. No, and I think I think you've covered it, Nachiket. I think that, you know, so I, I'm going to paste the link to our uh, resource uh, in, the, in the chat so you folks who want to check out the website, you can. Um, so what we've done is that we've got a fairly large team of volunteers, about 120 people. We've got a crowdsource database uh, from across the country. Um, you will also see a list of helplines uh, in one of the sections. And uh, there are, you know, what the states are now doing, the state, states and individual city governments are setting up helplines that one can call. Uh, unfortunately, in some cases, there is, there is an absolute supply demand mismatch and, and, you know, there is not a lot one can do. Uh, but I think the supply, like I said, is easing. Uh, so you will see that improve over the next few days. 
so there's life resources dot in which I've shared uh, in the chat, but there are a few others online that one can one can look at. Uh, there are you know helplines that one could call, uh, and and all of the other advice much it shared I think makes a lot of sense. It's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I would like to bring in um, Alex, if I may, uh, just from the international perspective. Um, both um, Nashkit mentioned, for instance, the the response from the international community. Um, I would like to ask Alex from a the UK government perspective, um, they've obviously swung into action uh, and supporting. And you've also talked in the past about the diaspora and the importance of the diaspora as a living bridge between countries. Uh, so could you share your perspective in terms of the UK-India uh, bilateral um, support that has been happening um, currently and to date? Sure, thank you very much. And hello, good afternoon to those of you who don't know me. Um, it's very nice to, to see you. Um, so, I mean, first of all, you heard of that situation, Sunny, and thank you very much for, for what you said, Ruth, for bearing witness to uh, the father and the parent. I, the, the response, I mean, there are different bits to it. Basically, first of all, there's a, there's a kind of government-to-government -government response, uh, and that's coming from different governments. The UK government uh, uh, sent out some um, oxygen concentrators, exactly what the previous speaker was speaking about, um, and 120 non-invasive uh, ventilators, manual ventilators. And they've come out over the last uh, at last at the end of the last week, the beginning of this week. And we've done that basically hand in hand with the foreign ministry here and with the Indian Red Cross. Actually, it's been a very straightforward process to get that stuff out here. Um, and uh, I think you know, in, in these situations, obviously, there's a risk of, of goodwill leading to sending things people don't want. So we'll be really clear about we'll be talking to the Indian government about their needs. Um, also, the other people also remind me of the importance of making sure your liability is correct. Um, um, and that's a uh, uh, lesson we've learned for many years of working on humanitarian issues. So, we sent stuff out to government to government. We've announced and we're sending out three kind of mini oxygen factories, for want of a better expression, um, which we uh, announced on Wednesday, which we'll send out any day now. Um, there's a kind of hardware. Uh, sorry, I sw I'll switch onto my headphones. For the, uh, See if I can be a bit clearer. Thank you. There we go. Hopefully that's a bit better. Yes, um, it is. We, great. So we've sent out uh, uh, about 600 bits of kits, uh, some sort of hardware, and we'll send out some more. Um, that's one part of it. And others are doing that as well to get you know, around the world. That's one part. And there's a kind of business uh, uh, contribution. Uh, and uh, some of the people on this call, I think uh, Lord Gadi is here and others, uh, we're involved with the call, which uh, I hosted with my Indian opposite number in London uh, on Monday evening, including the Appreciation Trust, to kind of go through, okay, what can we do, different organizations, business organizations, and then reaching out to their members. And there's a lot which can come from business. Thirdly, there's civil society. It's wonderful to see what your doing Appreciation Trust uh, and the support which that will bring. Uh, and I'd be delighted to be able to kind of people are reaching out to me and saying, I want to help. And I've been able to signpost to, to, to yourselves as, as well as to others. Um, uh, and finally, there's kind of expert to expert. And one of the great things that's going on, I mean, the, the chief scientific advisors uh, had quite a long conversation between the two countries on Tuesday, going through quite specific things around, um, for example, genomic sequencing, uh, exactly the point raised earlier about India's capacity in that area. Um, and also practitioner to practitioner support. You've got, um, there are more Indians working in the NHS than of any other nationality outside the UK, I think over 25,000. Uh, everyone will know uh, uh, um, physicians in India who have worked in the UK. We have physicians in the UK who speak, you know, speak all the different languages of, uh, of India. And so the other thing which is being to sprout up is kind of more direct links actually uh, with practitioners speaking to practitioners uh, about their experience. Because I think, this is terrible what's going on in India. This, it, we've had a really bad wave in the UK too. Um, there, we've got a lot of experience about, you know, what works and what doesn't work in those circumstances. So, you know, the knowledge and sharing of the knowledge, you know, that has to be applied locally in every country, in every situation. Within India, every bit part is different, but that is another useful thing. So it's actually, it, there's government, there's business, there's civil society, there's medical experts. You've got quite a lot uh, of different ways. And what I think, you know, you have this, India diaspora is huge, a big country with the biggest diaspora in the world and including uh, very substantial in the UK. And this is one of those moments where you kind of go, right, come on. Um, this is, uh, I remember uh, I am of an age where I read Margaret Thatcher's memoirs and um, in it she writes, 
uh, the Downing Street, where she writes a bit about a twinning that went on between Finchley, her constituency, um, and a, a town in Israel. She said, you know, and there was a, I think, that was great, there was some natural disaster in town in Israel, and the people of Finchley raised a lot of money. And those kind of direct connections, I think, are just totally admirable. That is, she said, that's what twinning means. And it's just wonderful to see, you know, in such a desperate, you know, it's such a bad situation uh, in India at the moment, but I say other parts of the world have experienced this too, to have that response and to see that the kind of words living bridge are a real thing. They're not just words, they're actually something which leads into action. And finally, I think, and I was saying to, to somebody who I signposted to the British Asian Trust, that there's an immediate need, uh, and that's oxygen and so forth, but there's a long, there's gonna be a long-term consequence of this and actually thinking a bit about the longer term as well and what are the areas where we're going to need to be working together to kind of build back better um so looking a bit further ahead i think as well as important and um, alice could you um share with us one of our um one of the audience is an nhs doctor and um and of course they're supporting in terms of the fundraising but they want to know what more can they do would there be any organizations that you would recommend in terms of signposting what's your thoughts on that so um, I know that there is um, uh, uh, there's a, 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 an organisation of um, medical professionals of Asian medical professionals in in the UK. Um, I also know there's an uh, organisation of um, Indian doctors worldwide. I'm sorry, I don't know the acronyms, but those both exist. But they, if I can just pick up the name, they can give to me afterwards. I can try and steer them towards the organisations because there's there's a lot of you know. I think there's much good things that could be done just through direct contact. So that's great to hear. And I I just for example, I saw the Manchester uh, India Partnership. They're already organising some medical direct medical things. I think the uh, Royal Society of Radiologists as well are also doing some direct uh, um, medical connections. So that kind of thing, I just think it's great. Great. And, and finally, Alex, um, what lessons do you think, um, you know, are there to be learned uh, in terms of how can we make the systemic changes in the healthcare system? And obviously the UK well, having gone <laughs> through this as well. That's a very big question and i'm not i'm not qualified to answer it i would observe two things uh listening to the real experts speaking about it one home isolation is really important um in stopping transmission uh within the home it's really difficult to isolate and that's true in the uk and it's true in india i think you can try but it's really hard the, but the other thing is vaccination in the end uh as, as the doctor was saying earlier that uh, long term, but you can't vaccinate faster than this epidemiological curve. Yeah, just can't do it. Mm -hmm. So you've got to keep uh, that. And vaccination is a function of supply. It's a function of money procurement and contracts. It's a function of logistics and it's a function of uh, convincing people who are worried about vaccination to get vaccinated. But logistics, my experience of life is that the logistics in the end are usually the hardest thing um, in anything. Um, uh, and that is the big challenge, particularly as was said earlier, when this, what is happening this wave is that these are spreading out really across the whole country, different stages, different times, but absolutely into the rural areas. Thank you, Alice. Um, Ajay, a question for you. Um, would, you sh would you let us know a bit more about the organization about SWATH? And in particular, I think what would be really interesting for people is how do you reach the, the remotest of remotest villages? I mean, you've done incredible work in terms of reaching out across India, but I mean, how do you logistically reach them? I mean, what, and so if you can share with us a bit more information about the organization, about this, the work that you do and, and about your reach uh, within India. Absolutely. So um, the, you know, like, like we mentioned earlier, SWAST is, a, is an alliance of uh, over 150 different uh, hospitals, uh, healthcare technology companies, nonprofits, and others in the technology sector, as well as health insurance companies. Uh, this came together during the last pandemic, in the first wave, of, I was say last pandemic, it seems so far away, but uh, came, came together during the first wave. And uh, what we traditionally focused on was technology, but uh, starting in about October last year, we had a huge effort to try and get oxygen concentrators to a last mile rural clinics. And uh, we worked in about seven states uh, in extremely hard to reach areas like Gachiroli in Maharashtra, which is a tribal uh, district with a lot of left-wing extremism. Uh, it, we reached Melghat also in Maharashtra, you know, parts of Chhattisgarh, uh, North Karnataka, Orissa, Rajasthan. Um, so they, these were sort of, you know, key partners that we worked with. These are healthcare organizations that have been in these areas for decades. 
uh, usually, usually, frankly, multi-generational, uh, you know, where people have come in and have been working there for 30, 40 years. Uh, and that's who we started with. Uh, but I think over the last few weeks, what's happened is that, and, and logistics was, it was relatively easy then because there were only a few places that we were getting this to. Uh, over the last few weeks, what's happened is that we suddenly are, are distributing a lot more uh, and we need a lot, you know, a lot tighter logistics. We are also trying to figure out reverse uh, supply chain because the idea here is that some of these might go into a temporary COVID center and then would need to be moved after it's, uh, after it's been used there. And, and the pandemic is sort of rippling through different states at different, at different times. So the demand is, is dynamic across geography and time. Uh, so all of this is, is something that our teams are actively grappling with. Uh, we don't have perfect answers for any of this in terms of how we allocate given all of these different variables. Uh, what we are committing to is that we, you know, A, do this equitably, fairly, and then B, be extremely transparent about what we do. Uh, in terms of your question on logistics, uh, we are now working with Amazon in India, with Luda, DHL in India, uh, with Delivery, which is another Indian logistics company for last mile logistics. Um, so I think it's going to be a very wide collaboration across industry, uh, without which I don't think we'd be able to service all the demand that we need to service. Um, and, and for now, we've been able to, we've been quite lucky to get pro bono support from some of the logistics partners, and, and we're hoping that can continue. And uh, Ajay, I, th I think a lot of people, are, yes. May I just add a word uh, to Please what I said? Please. The good thing is, you know, we've spoken about many challenges India has. The good thing is, for example, India has a wonderful road network. In fact, our road mm -hmm. density, I think only some European countries per square kilometer have more rural roads than India does. Uh, India Post, many delivery companies actually reach the last mile. Uh, the Indian Railways actually has deep connectivity. Uh, so physically delivering the product to the exact address. Uh, anybody that has ordered a mango, anybody that's ordered something from India, you will have a sense of it can be done. Challenge really is very much to make sure it's installed, people are trained, people know what to do, um, and all of the supportive. Uh, and this is where what the partners that Ajay mentioned uh, become quite super critical. Uh, Mr. Mr. Moore, can I ask just one thing? Obviously, the British Asian Trust has chosen to focus its efforts for this campaign on oxygen concentrators. Um, and obviously, this is what appears to be the greatest need, area of need currently. Um, you know, what would be really interesting from your perspective is how long do you anticipate that this specific need for oxygen concentrators will continue? And, and you did mention earlier on in the conversation about what you foresee and how you foresee the situation evolving, but just specifically around the oxygen concentrators. It's a large country, ma'am. So, you know, the reality is to uh, get this important tool in every hand uh, is going to require a lot more than we have. A back of the envelope suggestion when we were not anticipating this level of crisis was approximately 200 to 250,000 concentrators would give us good minimum coverage in every primary care center. Uh, across the country. And in some ways, at a moderate level of epidemic, this is enough. Uh, and my sense is that we could get back to that level uh, relatively uh, soon, uh, given how the pandemic is playing out. Uh, the good thing about the concentrators I mentioned to you, even if we end up with 500,000 of them, doesn't look likely right now, but depends on how the fundraising goes, depending on how the supply chain goes. There's actually a lot of utility uh, for the, these machines. Of course, once the pandemic is behind us, or maybe it'll never really be fully behind us, but you know, at a, at a level at which we can uh, think more broadly, uh, my belief is that it has really woken us up to the need for primary care. You know, India has always had, it doesn't seem like that if you watch your TV screens now, but we've always had very high quality hospital infrastructure. You want to do a liver transplant, you know, of course you can do it in many hospitals around the world, but India stands up. You know, you want to do a cardiac surgery, India can do a terrific job. It's really the primary care network. You know, if, I ask, if you ask me how many GPs of the UK style do we have mm. in a small town comparable to say Oxford, we, I, I could tell you that we don't actually. And I think what this is doing 
particularly this effort of oxygen concentrators, is beginning the journey of a stronger primary care system, where you are starting with equipment. And in a way, that's what SWAST was created for, to strengthen the primary care routes of the country. Many people work in cities and hospitals. This basic foundation is where I think this new wave in particular is drawing our attention. Thank you. Um, Ajay, a quick question. For those who are listening and they're on the call, how can they support um, in terms of you know, people who, you mentioned that you're getting pro bono support from logistic companies. If there's people on the call um, you know, with medical backgrounds, manufacturers, logistics, do they come to your website? You know, um, I mean, are there, is there information on your website to sign, signpost them? Because there's a lot of, I think, goodwill in the community who want to help, not only from the fundraising perspective, but also to help in terms of pro bono. Um, so what would you advise them? Thank you. Um, so there's a few different ways. So I think that, you know, we are uh, also looking to actually ramp up some of the medical support that we do. So physicians of Indian origin or people with licenses that can, that can practice in India um, are very welcome. We have a, we have a volunteering form that I'll paste in the chat uh, quite quickly. Uh, we also have a large open source technology community that's built out the website uh, that you that of which the link I've sent you, uh, and there's a Slack group there and a GitHub account there that you know techies could uh, actively start contributing to. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'll also paste the links for that in there. Um, I, I think those are you know some very immediate ways in which people can contribute. I think if people if there are folks with very specialized skills in supply chains, logistics, uh, would love to talk to them. Uh, Although I think we have a small team that is now uh, quite well settled, but uh, again, you know, would love to speak to experts who are uh, happy to share their time. Thank you, Ajay. And 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 um, Alex, from your perspective, um, we you know we have um, a few minutes left. Uh, anything that you wish to share in terms of what people can do to support can help. Uh, no, I think it's it's uh, it's great actually to hear from Dr. Ajay about some of the sort of practical ways you can do it. I think yeah. uh, contributing to the kind of uh, you've raised your 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 appeal and that there'll be others as well. Um, uh, I, I think you know if you have direct contacts, use them. Um, uh, and I also think kind of I can all these situations look just beyond just today. So, I mean, uh, 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 Nashik Moore was telling us a bit about the kind of longer term question, you know, how do you help beyond the immediate into the longer term to make increased resilience? Because a problem here is a problem in the UK and vice versa. If there's one thing that this pandemic reminds everyone, it is the degree to which you, things are connected. And because of the flow of people um, between the two countries and not just between the UK and India, uh, that is, uh, you know, we, this is a problem which we're going to have to deal with everywhere. Um, so that connection, I think, and then making it last beyond the uh, immediate. I'm quite sure one of the things which will come out at the government to government level will be a tighter UK-India health relationship um, because the stuff which we're doing now, the, the, there are issues which we're going to have to deal with for some time to come, uh, whether that's on vaccines, whether it's on diagnostics, therapeutics, or systems, um, as we were discussing, and that should be part of what we do. But it's just it's uh, it's great to see, frankly, um, you know, when there is a real challenge, people step up and go, yeah, I'd like to help. They, they do indeed. And, and I think that's why the work that the British Asian Trust do is so critical, because they are a bridge between South Asia um, and the UK and uh, and, you know, and bringing Salim uh, back into the conversation. I mean, I think a lot of people perhaps will be thinking in the back of their mind, but perhaps a bit shy to ask, um, how can people be sure that the funds that they're giving, um, you know, will really go to, you know, obviously the need of the hour, but to really bring about maximum impact. And obviously the British Asian Trust is a trusted organization uh, with a strong track record in this area, but how would you reassure people who are, who are, who are listening? And, um, and also following on from there, where do you think the priorities, you know, will? will emerge after we, we come out of this immediate crisis. So over to you, Salim. Thank you. Um, and I, I will talk on behalf of uh, Swast, and I, I think Ajay should add, but uh, you know, before we partnered with Swast, I think just the technology platform that they have, which allows them to aggregate the demand in, in, in across states where the need is the most pressing, you know, and basis that is what the distribution is going to happen is absolutely fantastic. We've looked at that entire model at which changes real time with the way the data is changing every day. It is talking to the government systems 
So it's very clear that you know, all the funds that come in first go into support areas and states where the need is the most pressing. It's not going to be in the order of priority that the donor chooses, but it's going to be allocated basis where the need is the maximum. And I think that's, uh, and the fact that it's backed with such a strong technology platform, which also feeds back with uh, information. We are working with them on the best way to also feed back impact information back to the donors so that uh, they are absolutely uh, updated about how their donations are getting applied and uh, you know what is the impact that their support is making. Uh, the aggregated demand that we understand from them is, is huge. It's about 200,000 concentrators, which have to be placed across 20,000 approximately healthcare and medical units, which is mapped across states. Uh, we've made a humble start and the support that we're getting is absolutely humbling. It's, it's overwhelming to see the support that's pouring in both from UK and from India. Uh, so um, I thank everybody, uh, everyone for all the support that uh, you are giving to our initiative. For those of you who want to support further, you can go on to the British, uh, British Asian Trust website at www.britishasiantrust.org or write into any of us. We'll be very happy to loop back at the quickest. I'll only urge you that the need is urgent, the need is now. Whatever support, uh, whether financial, in kind, or you want to have a conversation on how you can support our initiative further, we all are available at all times to have that conversation with you. So please reach out to us and thanks in advance for all the support that all of you are extending. Thank you. Thank you, Salim. And thank you to, to the panelists who have taken the time to join us on the session and sharing their insight on the ground. I, th I think it's been incredibly critical for people to understand what is happening beyond the headlines. Um, and also, you know, for those who are um, watching, you, know, you can also follow British Asian Trust on social media. We're constantly updating, you know, what is happening in terms of, um, you know, of, of where the funds are going. Um, and also, I would like to also thank um, the British Asian Trust team, because I've witnessed how they have been working evenings, weekends. Um, they have struggled with their own losses. They have struggled um, themselves. We have a team based in India, but their first and foremost um, was to keep working, keep on going. And I think, you know, we also have to acknowledge the British Asian Trust team who work behind the scenes as well. So thank you for everyone. Over to Hitton. Um, all that remains for me to say is thank you to all of you for participating again. Um, it's excellent to see so many of you take the time to uh, come on board for this webinar today to understand what we are doing with the funds that we are collecting. And we are going to ensure that we're coming back to all of you, our donors, all the people who have been supporting us with this emergency work. Uh, we will be coming back to you to tell you where that funding is being used and how it's being utilised. So thank you again. And for any of you um, looking to donate, still, there are the, that's been put in the chat as well today. So thank you from all of us, and we hope to see and be able to speak to you all again soon.